My PhD was about virtual reality experiences and what audiences want from them. Because most of the time, audiences just aren't asked about their participation in experiences, entertainment or, or technology-wise. So that's, that was the focus of my PhD. My background is in media production, so film, TV, documentaries, photos, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I manage the media department back uh, in my university back home. I'm here uh, as part of a two-month, five-country, five-educator uh, project. Uh, and it's not to examine super high-end VR. We may have talked about uh, that I'm involved in VR. It's super low-budget, extremely ultra-low-budget uh, VR, which kind of democratizes VR, and it allows people like yourselves to immediately go out and start creating very simple VR projects yourself. So this is me on a VR coaster. So this is a real coaster, but you have a virtual experience uh, laid over the top. You can see I've got a little uh, headset in my hands. So I've conducted VR experiments with students and vendors all around the world, and I've seen some really cool behind-the-scenes uh, demonstrations uh, and experiences that just knocked my socks off, that were really not ready for prime time, for um, you know, mass consumer entertainment. I'm really quite excited about the technology, but at the same time, I'm not one of those people that says, oh, VR, we've got a VR, everything is the most important thing. Not at all. I think that there's very specific applications for VR, and it's a lot less than, uh, than most people think. But what I'm trying to say is that I'm quite excited uh, about the technology, but I'm also very aware that it's miles away from how it's actually promoted in entertainment, in education, uh, in tourism experiences. It is much less, the reality is much less exciting than the way that VR is actually promoted. For some strange reason, uh, working on this project, which is talking about uh, ultra-low cost virtual reality, um, vendors, VR vendors, have really attacked me um, because these are the people that will claim that by showing uh, sort of off-the-shelf templated experiences in schools and, and uh, educational um, organisations is doing VR. But actual fact, it's not because, I mean, you're just... There may be something in it that you can get a sort of a little sense uh, of what a VR experience is about. But it, unless it's actually something that's tailored to... Uh, the pedagogical needs of a class, like literally an educator has said, the students don't understand this and no other technology is going to do it for us so we can put some VR in there. If it's not actually specifically crafted in that way, it's not likely to stick. It won't actually stay. And, and it's, sort of, it's, it's kind of a surface experience as opposed to actually being a genuine part of the pedagogy and using VR as just another form of media, which... I'm not mocking VR, but it is just another form of media. That's all it is. And there's times where you would use it, times where you wouldn't use it. But some people want to use it all the time. But the, the most important thing is that uh, any, any sort of technology, VR included, needs to start from a pedagogical problem. If it doesn't, don't do it. It's getting virtual and augmented reality right at a very sophisticated level requires a lot of hardware, very expensive developers, rock solid internet. You have good internet here, but uh, back home in Australia, not so much. Uh, and particularly for students that are remote, they're not going to have a chance to, uh, to experience these sorts of things. Hopefully this isn't uh, telling you what you already know, but uh, a really useful analogy for VR and AR is the Terminator versus um, the Matrix. In uh, the Matrix, Neo and his friends are completely in that world. They're 100% surrounded. Everything reacts, you know, uh, uh, as they are in that world, it's completely replaced their reality. This is very high-end virtual reality. The Terminator, do you remember the bit in The Terminator when he had no clothes and he was in a bar and he was trying to look for clothes? That's a really good example of augmented reality in that you see reality, but there's like an overlay uh, on top. VR, I, I liken to 3D and that they go on slopes of popularity and failure. And I do believe that uh, VR is back down in the troughs again uh, in terms of, you know, widespread uh, cultural availability. Because um, if it wasn't, why would we not be doing this in VR? Why don't you actually have headsets with you right now? It's an example of the fact that it hasn't actually permeated uh, uh, mass consumer culture. And that's fine. Like, uh, there's certain areas that it's still quite use very useful, actually, in uh, entertainment, in training, and in certain parts of uh, education as well. I think... 
one of the reasons that it's kind of gone back down that trough is because the reality hasn't matched the way it's been promoted. And that's always been promoted completely uh, over the top. As I said before, uh, in 2017 for my PhD, I was looking at what audiences want from virtual reality entertainment experiences. So I went on a global data gathering tour, all for science, for science very much, uh, seeking to define exactly what audiences or customers want from a VR amusement ride experiences, experience. I interviewed several uh, participants at the conclusion of their VR entertainment experience uh, and really just essentially asked them a series of fixed questions, uh, asking what did they think, did they understand it, what, the, what would they change, etc., etc. There are several ways to define what a VR amusement experience actually means. So the most common way when, when it's connected to uh, rides is that the existing ride, so the existing roller coaster or drop tower or even a water slide, we'll talk about that, it just has a VR experience laid over the top. So you end up you know, wearing a headset and, and seeing something different, but you're physically experiencing all the G-forces and drops and inversions and you know, whatever's going on in that ride at the same time. You still... Um, you can see and sometimes you can hear uh, different things as well. Although when you're on a big roller coaster like these, it's sometimes quite hard to hear when you just have a wee little headset uh, on, you, um, on your head. This has also been added to swinging ships. Uh, you can have a different experience in the swinging ships. And then drop rides. So uh, there was, uh, in America, there was, a, I think, 400, 415 foot drop ride, which is scary enough in the real world, but overlaid with VR, it becomes like a thousand feet high and you're flying above a, 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 a city. Very cool. This is wacky, right? The, so the lady that I'm with on the, uh, the demon is a physics professor from Lund University. We're actually, we worked on a VR project separately, but it was raining uh, at the time. That's why it's got those little uh, raincoats on them. And she's very experienced in this. I, I was pretty experienced at the time. And both of us in the queue, this is going to be stupid, when it had the little raincoat on it, we said, how are we going to see? <laughs> right? Well, we weren't going to see because we weren't seeing anything outside. It was all inside. I thought it was kind of cute. So VR water slides. So that is an actual water slide, again, with a VR experience put over the top. There have been some that uh, are completely digital, as in you're not going on a water slide. You're just sitting somewhere being kind of moved around. But this was a real VR water slide. Um, that's me down the bottom uh, taking a spin on a real water slide experience with a VR overlay that I consulted on at uh, Galaxy Erding Water Park in Munich. And it seemed to be, and we still think it is, the first actual VR water slide experience. And it was, it was hilarious. It was completely bizarre to, uh, to go on this ride. But during the development of it, because I did not develop it, I was just consulting on it. During the development, uh, they, they changed themes several times, but they, in the end they sort of settled on a spacey kind of theme. And the first demo that I saw, now I wasn't on the ride, I wasn't even in the country, it, it, you were just sort of floating around in space. And I knew from uh, the literature about immersion and how to get a sense of speed that they would need more. So first of all, you need things moving close to your field of vision to give you a sense of speed. Uh, and the second thing is people need to predict where the ride is actually going. So there need to be some semblance, like a ghostly version of a track or something, that people could kind of follow. So I went back and forth with the American developers, uh, and eventually they added that, and it worked. It actually made a big difference, that uh, you really got much more of a, a sense of things going past you, and then because you could see kind of what was going to happen, it helped you, you could prepare for these uh, dips and drops uh, a little bit more. The, the original water slide was just nice. It was a nice water slide. It wasn't super scary. It wasn't super wild. It was a bit old, and that's what happens with a lot of these rides. When they get a bit old, they just put a bit of VR on it to, uh, to jazz it up. So this water slide was good, it had a couple of drops, it had a couple of launches where the water like pushed you up a hill. It was fine, it was good, but it, it wasn't that exciting. So we made it in the story that uh, you were boating on a lava-filled uh, volcano and the drops, this is the cool part, right? The story that you can tell in VR enhances the, uh, the real sensation because your body, this is very important, your body can easily be tricked into two things. Your mind can be tricked into believing you're in a virtual environment very easily. As long as everything kind of reacts the way you expect and, you know, the sounds sort of react the way you expect, you can feel you're in a, a different place. Secondly, if the water slide went down, say, five foot uh, in its physical uh, location, in the experience, you could make a drop like 100 feet, and it's wild, like it's scary and crazy, but you're still just going down that little five-foot drop. 
for the launches where, you know, the water would push you up the hill, uh, we had the volcano was exploding, right? And then the lava was pushing you up the hill. And it worked. It really, really worked. It, it made it seem like you were going really, really fast. It's kind of based on, on similar principles that are employed in fairground rides. There's this really awesome ride. They have it at Alton Towers. They have it, I think they've got, they're pretty sure they have quite a few of uh, these rides in Europe. You're in a room, a big room. You've got a row of uh, seats on either, so you're sort of facing the middle uh, on either side. And what happens is the room actually rotates around you. But it feels like you're going upside down. It 100% feels like you're going upside down. And the, the way that they do it is not just the room rotating around you, but the, the actual uh, ride vehicle itself, it just tips back ever so slowly so that you're pushing back in your seat just a little bit. I'm talking a couple of degrees. And then it just tips forward ever so slightly, so you're slightly moving out of your seat. These are very, very subtle. But when it's coupled with the damn room going upside down around you, you honestly feel like you're going to fall out of your seat. It absolutely works. It's another way of showing that we can be easily tricked. Our mind can be easily tricked. A little bit of G-force, a little bit of visual stimuli, away you go. That's the same with, uh, with VR. So that was a VR experience which was really quite new. It was a, a, a new narrative that was overlaid onto the existing physical narrative. And then the addition of more story and certain visual cues just turned it right up. So uh, I think the story was particularly important. But these rides that I've been talking about represent some of the most advanced examples uh, of immersive entertainment on the planet, in my belief. But once I analysed the data from my PhD, of those people that were getting off these experiences. Once I analysed it for trends and themes, one thing came through loud and clear from the audiences. We want story. We want more story. Which I think is really cute, right? All this money, all this high tech, but people want more story. Like literally, what we would do around the campfire many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Many years ago, the idea of interactivity uh, on theme park rides became a thing. And it failed because people want to be told a story. They don't want to create a story when you go on a ride. Anyway, here's some hilarious comments from my research after people emerging from various VR ride experiences. So we've got the good on one side and the not so good on the other side. It's thrilling. The animation is just so cool, like looking around, like being somewhere. You know this whole world take you to another place. It's cool. Takes you to a whole new world. I hop on and I put on the headset and suddenly I'm in an old kingdom. I didn't even know I was there until you hear the noise coming back to the station. It was amazing. When we came back, I didn't feel like I was even at the theme park. Like when I took the goggles off, I was like, wow. Okay, so that's good. And then we have this. <laughs> I just think it's flying around and stuff. I don't think there's a story. If there is, I don't know what it is. I mean, you have dwarves and a regular human people, and then you have a dragon in a cave, but then you have a bat that's flying around. Like, what's the backstory to the whole situation? I think they went in a lot in depth with a lot more of the graphics. I think they could have put more in the storyline itself. This last one I think is hilarious because the person is kind of saying it was okay, but then they're saying it still needed a story. They had to make up their own story. A lot of people say you need to have a backstory and all that, but I kind of enjoyed the idea that you don't really know what's going on. You kind of have to make up your own little story. <laughs> so it's so inherent. It's so in our genes that we need a story, we need narrative, that people are making it up. <laughs> I just think that's absolutely hilarious. This, we'll talk about this model in a second. This is uh, one of the outputs from my PhD as well. Tech first promotion is a mistake. Um, so many times during the sort of heyday, I suppose, of VR entertainment rides, because again, it's kind of gone down that hill, uh, rides were promoted as, come and try our VR ride. And what came out of that in the data was people either didn't know what it was or they're not turned on by promises of technology. What they were turned on by was come and ride a dragon over the forest and shoot Ewoks, whatever you end up doing. And you'll do it with the latest technology. You'll do it with really cool stuff that makes you feel like you're there. That's what people ended up needing to, uh, to drag people in. Don't just promote the VR because it's kind of like a nerds club where you know we all know what VR is and we're cool because we're nerds. And if the audience doesn't get it, well, they're just stupid. No, people are like, we don't get it. We're not interested. So do not promote tech first. In tourism, if you've got some wonderful new super high-tech experience, I know that it's hard because you want to tell everyone what great 
tools you've got and how much money it costs. They don't care. They want to know what the experience is going to be like. It's very experiential. The thing is that uh, vendors will promote uh, and have promoted uh, these experiences as technology first because they're ignoring the lure of what's called narrative transportation. And it's a very de desirable state in entertainment experiences where consumers lose track of the real world by being absorbed in a story. I think we've all had this, whether you've gone to a movie or you've been on a ride and it's just so cool and awesome, you, you've completely lost track of where you were and you were just there, you were living it, you're kind of in flow, if anyone knows uh, about the concept of flow. So narrative transportation enables immersion and in VR that enables escapism, which means we all get that much desired magical moment of forgetting the world and all its problems for just a moment. So the research shows that game developers, and just so you know that uh, the narrative of games is very much uh, linked to the narrative of virtual reality experiences, sophisticated virtual reality experiences. We don't really compare VR to um, movies uh, or music or theatre. It's generally compared to, uh, to games. This was one of the uh, outputs from my VR PhD. And what it shows is the middle ring, uh, the elements. So it's critical components of a VR entertainment experience. You can absolutely transfer this to a lot of educational, tourism, uh, uh, applications as well. So you have to have, you have to observe the rules of entertainment. So classic rules of entertainment. You have to have an advanced description of the VR experience. We'll talk about advanced description in a second. The hardware experience, e.g. the headset, whatever it is you're using, has to be perfect. The audio video experience, so what you see and what you hear, has to be perfect. Uh, and over here, the uh, queuing and the headset and the on and off boarding also has to be really well done. All these things in the middle are critical. They all have to hit just right for a VR experience to actually work, and more than often, they did not. The second ring is what the literature says. So basically, the research says all these elements have to be considered in creating VR entertainment. So things like immersion, the, uh, the hygiene of the hardware, the, it can't be too heavy, it needs to have a wide field of view, it needs to be easy to secure. The advanced description, the intensity level needs to be promoted appropriately. Now, in entertainment, particularly in, in thrill rides and theme parks, have you ever seen anything that was actually promoted at the correct level of intensity? No, that's not how theme park people get rich. They say, this is going to change your world, this is going to be the most amazing thing ever, even if it's sort of a, a basic kind of ride. What happens is that leads to people are less impressed in the end. So they, they set the intensity level wrong. But you try telling a theme park to promote their new ride as, it's okay, come and try it, it's not going to happen. Um, other things like... Um, the rules of entertainment. So the research says the rules of entertainment, you have to have a story. You have to be fun and create delight. You need to be culturally appropriate. The story needs to be fully resolved. You need to be populist. In the past, entertainment was separated from art and that entertainment was for the masses, but art was for the bourgeoisie. So entertainment uh, is vulgar, meaning that it appeals to the masses. And in the past, that was bad. You didn't want that. But now, it's good. So you have to be populist or vulgar, you have to appeal to the masses. So the story that you come up with, it can't be some incredibly localised Slovenian story, as beautiful as it might be, if you're trying to attract people from all around the world. Uh, and observe the hero's journey structure. So if, does anyone know about the hero's journey? It's Star Wars, basically. So the hero's journey is the backbone of pretty much every successful piece of uh, Western popular entertainment. Someone is a little bit maligned. They uh, get taken on a journey. Uh, they get challenged and they return from their journey back to where they came from changed. And it's, it's much more complex than that, but that's basically what it boils down to. And if you look at Star Wars, Matrix, like any super-duper expensive popular film in the last 50 years, it will follow the hero's journey. Finally, the audiences. That's the outer ring. The audiences say, the original VR experience participant research, that's the stuff that I did with the audiences, led to these findings. So... I'll just I'll give you a couple more. Um, hardware. The headsets were previously uncomfortable, but they're improving. Headset hygiene is important to audiences. Who knew? Uh, another funny thing that, uh, that I found out, which came after this was actually uh, done, is a lot of women did not want to put the headsets on because it would mess their hair up or it would mess their makeup up. Now, as a dude, I don't really wear a lot of makeup uh, and I don't really worry about having hair because it's all falling out. I didn't even think of that. But uh, a lot of women are like, I don't want to go on that because it's going to... I'll look like a mess afterwards. That's a big deal, right? The, uh, the rules of entertainment. Audiences have differing levels of need for entertainment. So this was uh, by a researcher, not me. Uh, it was called your NENT score, your need for entertainment score. 
Some people, it's high. Some people, it's quite low. But audiences approach uh, the kind of entertainment experiences differently. Don't be too educational. <laughs> people don't want this. They want it to be fun. VR experiences do not need to be promoted as VR experiences. I mentioned that before. The first impressions of VR really lock people in. I've never really seen this before. I'm sure it's existed before, but people tend to give VR one chance. They'll try it. If it makes them feel sick, if it's a smelly headset, they're done with it. They go, I don't like VR. I'm not going to do it again. So you shouldn't bleat on about the technology. You should reveal only as much as what people need. So you're going to have this fantastic experience flying over a forest, shooting dragons, whatever, and you do it inside this cool headset. Like you, that's, you just sort of, it's almost like an afterthought to, uh, to get people in. Most VR entertainment experiences are short, very short. If you think about a ride, what's, it's over in like 60 seconds. It doesn't necessarily allow for in-depth stories or narrative to be developed. And often, you've got some crazy forces at work. Like if you're dropping from 400 feet high, if you're getting turned upside down on roller coasters, you can't necessarily have subtlety in stories because you won't see it, you won't hear it. So in the active ride portion, it can be difficult to introduce a sophisticated narrative or any kind of narrative, really. But it seems the current offerings, or at least the offerings when I was collecting this data, were over, were, could be pushing more traditional narratives or a simple story uh, as an effective technique. We have established that immersion is required for uh, a quality VR experience. So immersion, feeling like you're there. The immersion is created by all the technology working perfectly. Good luck with that. Having a fantastic uh, narrative overlay. Good luck with that. It's really quite hard to, uh, to make this work. But you do need that immersion to actually make the experience work. It's, immersion has always been the goal of VR, to make you feel like you're there, right? Um, but the finding of VR immersion goes further to understand the contextual applications of this element. It's proposed by me that uh, the, due to the need of entertainment experiences to provide escapism, that a new type of immersion is required called entertainment immersion. So it's specific, it's novel, and it's, it's for developers uh, of any of these kind of experiences to be aware of. It's because it presents a new nuanced form which moves past the elements of immersion, presence, engagement, arousal, interpretab interpretability, and vection, which have been previously um, discussed in some of my work. When everything is working correctly, and like I said, that's a very high bar, VR goes beyond mere immersion and takes audiences to a place with a psychologically and ontologically disconcerting quality. So many virtual spaces spontaneously appeared as something spiritual, and reality itself can no longer be seen as a stable platform because VR has an impact on the perception of consciousness and the body. So cool. And I can absolutely attest to this. Like I said before, this is going to sound very elite, but uh, when I was actually doing the data collection uh, for, for this particular project, I got to see some behind-the-scenes in development uh, VR plans from uh, these big companies. And it was a mess to set up. Like there was computers and cables and absolute mess. They had to measure the distance between my pupils and move things back and forth and cables and cables and cables and, you know, finally get it going. But it was so good, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to live in that environment. I'm not a particular nerd when it comes to games or things like that. I certainly respect games and I think they're fantastic. But it was just, it was so beautiful. Like they were absolutely superb. They were so well done that it really did have this spiritual quality, a, a ontologically disconnecting quality. It really, really was. So I, that's why I believe in this technology in certain very specific uh, ways. But I believe that uh, VR entertainment narrative could be an entirely new form of narrative. It's different because narrative on these rides operates very differently uh, in this environment because it's clearly uh, a different form of, of the classical structures of narrative. It employs elements of traditional screen narratives with added immersion, uh, G-forces, and interplay of time and space. The, uh, like I was saying before, some of these experiences were as short as 60 seconds. So in narrative in this environment has to function differently to a two-hour game, to a two-hour movie or a game that couldn't last for months. You could counter this for the fact that some songs are almost as short as that and they still manage perfectly well to, uh, to deliver a narrative, something to think about. But like I was saying before, the, the actual narrative can be compared to a game in that it's full of stops and starts, uh, loops and returns. So this can be applied to some of the more interactive forms of experiential VR. But like I was saying before, the most important thing is that the story and screen in experiential VR is combined with physical movement you don't need to generally uh, consider physicality uh, in traditional entertainment such as film. 
So the shape of the ride contributes to the story. If the body's moving, that movement is part of the narrative, then essentially all the elements of the immersive narrative need to be very carefully synchronised with real-world elements to provide a cogent experience. This, this leads to what I've done with Tiatia, and it also leads to you being able to actually create your own narratives uh, in virtual reality. So the genuine thrill of VR in education is the data collection's a lot of fun. Uh, it's... If you take it to the extreme, it's kind of the ultimate capitalist experience. I mean, when you have this, if you were to ever have, it may never happen, this incredibly sophisticated VR experience with motion simulators that will, you know, move you back and forth. You could literally sit at home and just consume, just consume these experiences nonstop. Disney, good old Disney, they're almost moving in this direction and that they did uh, very carefully and, and at a very high level plot out uh, their parks to record them uh, in VR. So you could literally sit there on your headset and kind of skip between different parts of uh, Disney, go on their rides virtually. If you have one of these amazing motion simulators, which uh, I've been on, that, that work together beautifully uh, with telemetry from, uh, from these, uh, these actual rides, it can feel like you're there. And it's not hard to see the next step could be a much more sophisticated experience that makes you genuinely feel you're there and you have to pay Disney 20 bucks a month to experience their virtual parks. So it could be the ultimate capitalist experience uh, of consumers just sitting at home and consuming, like the people from Wall-E. Do you remember Wall-E, the people that were really fat and they just like moved around on those little hoverboards? <laughs> that, that could be the future. In education, the problems are financial. The tech has to work perfectly for immersion to be achieved, meaning the teachers have to be tech wizards or you have to have this incredibly supportive uh, IT department. Uh, Synchronisation is another one. Uh, how does everyone's experiences start at once? There is technology that can do that, but it's an extra expense. If you don't have that expensive technology and everyone's starting their experiences at separate, separate times, it'll just be a cacophony. Like, uh, if, if we can all hear the audio, it'll be a mess. But if we can't hear the audio, how does the educator know who's where? Like, have, have you started? Have you finished? Are you halfway through? Is there something wrong? Um, the sound. Like I said, if people don't have headphones, it will just be this crazy cacophony in the classroom. Most often, and I may have said this in the beginning, uh, the IT department gets a bunch of expensive computers and VR headsets, locates them on metro campuses with stock experiences and tick, call it a day. So we're done. We've actually done VR. Um, with the internet, unless your internet is absolutely perfect you, and you're able to somehow access those uh, headsets and experiences at home, if you can't get to the campus, it's not going to work. And if there's any kind of, interacti any, any kind of interactivity required and your internet's no good, it's definitely not going to work. It will doubly not work. So another thing is that uh, Facebook is behind one of some of the, uh, the biggest hardware in VR, and they're also demanding people use their Facebook or their Meta accounts to log in so they can be tracked. So that introduces horrible uh, privacy and ethical issues as well. This is stuff you can do now for free. And this is the point of the actual uh, project that I'm doing. So all these cool experiences that I've had, I did work in uh, Lund University with a Swedish physics professor on a, a quite nicely funded project for a sort of mid-level, maybe slightly higher um, VR experience. So I've had exposure to uh, sort of the, the higher end, but I realised that uh, this is such a, an exclusive seeming technology and it's very hard to get your hands on it that I wanted to do a project, this project that I'm here for, ultra low cost, totally accessible uh, VR that still manages to tick the box, tick the boxes of immersion and, you know, experience. And this is what we did. So you can use, uh, generally when you create VR experiences, you're either creating them uh, like in a game engine. They, there are a lot of them are created in game engines. Uh, or if they're video-based, they, uh, they use pretty fancy cameras to, um, to make it go. We, we just don't have access to this. Most schools don't have access to this. The headsets are incredibly expensive, all the stuff I was talking about before. Using things like, so Google Street View, the reason I got this highlighted, this is very important, Google Street View enables you to capture a room or, or a situation from a static point of view in 360. So, so it's stills, it's a still, it's not videos. You can capture it, so basically you click, 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 up and down, up and down, all around, all around, all around, all around. Press the button, it stitches it together and you have what's called a photosphere, it is really cool. Google Street View is going away at the end of March, so get it now. If you have any interest in this whatsoever, it's, a, it's only available on Android now. It used to be iOS and Android. Any interest in this whatsoever now or in the future, download Google Street View free now, literally now. So once you've created your, what, what we did in this project, we uh, got students to go to, actually I won't, I won't reveal too much because I want Chiaja to, uh, to talk about what we actually did, but we 
We created a photosphere with Google Street View. We got students to use a free MP3 audio recorder on, but it's on their phones, a free MP3 audio recorder on their phones to talk about the, uh, the scene that they were in as if they were in it. And then we used Expeditions Pro, which is also free. Uh, it's an app as well as a, a, a website where you can put the street, uh, sorry, where you can put the photospheres plus the audio together, send it back to your phone and use these little glasses to make you feel like you're there. It is the most base level of virtual reality, but it actually works. It really does work. Um, now, they're not free, unfortunately. They're probably like five bucks each. But when you compare it to the seven, eight, nine thousand dollars, a hundred to a thousand dollars for the headsets, it's five bucks. So you can easily stick them in your pocket and then take them wherever you want. Very, very important. Um, we also, we're doing, we've already done that one, but uh, we're doing, I'll take you through here. This is what uh, Chasha and her class and I did on Tuesday. So we did virtual reality. We're going to do augmented reality. I'll just say very briefly, augmented reality uses Adobe Aero, uh, which is a, a great free, free, free way. I don't think it's going away, so you don't have to rush to download it. It's a great free way to create simple uh, augmented reality. And what we're doing with that one is we're going to the water tower. Here, 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 there. We're going to the water tower, and we are simply using some old... Uh, imagery of the water tower. Same thing, the students are going to record a little, you know, 30 second, one minute story about what those uh, old images mean. And when we go to the water tower and hold our phones up in the Adobe Aero app, these images will appear. So we just get this extra bit of information. Uh, the imagery of what it used to look like and also the, uh, the audio about uh, what you're seeing.